Welcome back to our study in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be picking up our study where we left off last time, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 17. By way of review, last time we were in Matthew chapter 16, and we talked about uh, some things there, mainly that uh, the chapter began with the Pharisees testing Jesus. We see that in verses uh, 1 through 12. Uh, and Jesus gives a warning there in verse 12, or rather 8 through 11, but it says the disciples understood that when he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, he was talking about their teaching. Beware of their teaching. And so they took that lesson to heart. And then we see in, in verses 13 through 20, we talked about how Jesus promised to build only one church. And we touched on how uh, the, the claim that, well, you know, that Jesus is the brand, you know, vine and all the different church stay are the branches that doesn't hold up. When we read in John chapter 15 that Jesus says, I'm the vine, you, disciples, are the branches. And so if we want to be pleasing to God, we want to be part of that one church. Uh, what he, Jesus talked about here in chapter 16. Jesus at the end of chapter 16 began to teach more explicitly and with more frequency that he was going to soon have to suffer at the hands of the people die through crucifixion and be raised on the third day. And we looked over how um, Peter didn't like that. And Peter uh, had a thought. He was, he was troubled about you know, losing his friend. He said, Lord, forbid it that this would ever happen to him. And Jesus rebukes him to get behind me, Satan, for you are putting your interests, you're putting your thoughts on the interests of the man and not of God. Peter, in that moment, uh, when he opposed the will of God, whether, no matter how good the intention was, and I believe it was a good intention, he want, he didn't want to see ill or harm or death come to his friend, uh, he was advancing the will of Satan when he was doing that because he was actively opposed to the will of God. So Jesus rebukes him for that, and Peter gets in line, more or less. We ended the chapter with the discussion how discipleship is costly, but the cost, there is no cost uh, not worth paying in order to be uh, in Christ, be a disciple of his, and be pleasing to God. So we're going to pick up uh, in chapter 17. There's really three main divisions here. We have the transfiguration, which is the beginning part of chapter 17. There is the healing of a demonic, uh, which Jesus does in verses 14 through 23. And then there's an interesting little situation with the temple tax at the end of the chapter in verses 24 through 27. So we'll start now, uh, reading in chapter 17, verse 1 through verse 13. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like, that, like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out, out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell, on their face, fa fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, Why then did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. So we're told that six days after the events of chapter 16, Jesus takes the inner circle of the disciples. He takes with him Peter, James, and John. Uh, John in his gospel referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, James and uh, Peter, uh, James also uh, can be, uh, get my note here real quick, uh, James or Jacob, those names kind of are interchangeable there, 
Uh, they mean basically the same thing. This is the inner circle of the apostles. And so Jesus selects them to come to the mountain to see him transform, transfigure before them, to see the glory of God in a sense there. And when he goes up the mountain, he is transformed. That is, the transfiguration happens. He begins, he now has a radiance about him. His, his clothing is whiter than any white, uh, any, any tailor or any launder on earth could produce. And he, he's shown like that of a son, like the son. And we're told that Moses and Elijah appeared next to him. Now, there's some interesting some symbolicness about this. Moses and Elijah represent Moses was the last lawgiver. Moses, in many ways, is a type of Christ. He foreshadowed Christ because Moses uh, was a mediator between man and God. Moses intercede for the people when they sinned. Moses uh, was the mediator of the first covenant. Um, so he foreshadowed. In fact, in Deuteronomy, Moses said, there will come a day when God will raise up a prophet like me, listen to him. And that prophecy is in reference to Jesus. Uh, so Moses represents the old law. Elijah represents all the prophets. Um, and Jesus, of course, represents the new covenant, the new law, the, the law of liberty, which he is now teaching and laying the foundation, which will come into full effect when he dies on the cross and is resurrected. And Peter says it is good for us to be here. Peter recognized the, the significance of what was taking place before them. They, get, they saw the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, be transformed before them that they could see his full radiance, that is as full as one could in human form. Um, and he said we should be, build three tabernacles or tents of dwelling uh, or three places of worship, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Again, they recognize the significance of what was happened, happening there. Now, some have asked the question, how did Peter know that the two other people appearing there with Jesus was Moses and Elijah? You know, Moses had been dead for, well, thousands, over a thousand years by this point. Elijah just maybe, you know, not as long as Moses, but maybe just as long as far as time's concerned. Um, they both were dead and there was no photographs of them and and so how did they know what they looked like? Now, I can't say for certain, but I, I do think there's a hint to help us provide an explanation for how they knew in chapter 16. Uh, we just read this last week, but if you look at chapter 16 in verse 17, after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he said to him in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That is, flesh and blood by his own human reasoning, by, by the evidence around him, uh, to some degree. You know, it wasn't by his sheer, own, his sheer reasoning and logic. It was by, the, by God revealing it to him. Now, in that case, God revealed it to Peter by the fact that Jesus worked the signs, which testified to Jesus being the Son of God and being deity. He he perhaps even saw the scriptures, the prophecies being fulfilled before him. You know, Jesus fulfilled prophecy in front of the disciples. Um, but I believe this verse in chapter in verse 17, chapter 16, reveals a principle that Peter it's not outside the realm of possibility, and with the precedent we see in scripture that Peter was made known that it was Elijah and Moses by God himself. Um, because he clearly understood who they were. Well, who else would have given that knowledge except perhaps God alone? And so that's one explanation I've gone with over the years. I think it's the one that fits the best. I mean, he had no photograph. We're told previously that flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father is in heaven, so it makes sense to me that God revealed it to him here. But regardless of how he knew, he knew that this was Moses and Elijah. And so, they, after Peter makes a statement that we should build three tabernacles here, a voice comes from heaven, uh, the voice of God. Uh, this is not the first time in the Gospels we've seen this. If we go back to the baptism of Jesus um, in Matthew chapter uh, 3, we're also told that in verse 16, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove landing on him. And behold, a voice out of heaven uh, said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So this is not the first time God has spoken 
audibly to people in the Gospels. However, this is a very... What we do find here that's different is, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. My Bible, I, I have a color coordinating system. Uh, I underline uh, statements of authority. The word authority, or in my name, that's an authoritative phrase. In brown, I have in my Bible, listen to him. It's underlined in brown. Because I understand this, that God is saying to James, Peter, and John, that not only is Jesus Nazareth my son in whom I am well pleased, not only is he the beloved son of the living God that we saw him in Matthew 16, he has my authority. I am telling you that you are to listen to him. He has my authority. Which means Jesus would be the final say in all things when it comes to religion. And whatever he taught and whatever his apostles taught would be the final say. That's our New Testament. But he's emphasizing that I have given him the authority. Now, when they hear this, they have, I believe, the appropriate response. They drop face down uh, in fear and in, in reverence. Uh, they were terrified. And, and Jesus came to them in verse 7, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw it was just Jesus standing alone. So they saw a glimpse of the glory of God. They saw a glimpse of what was to come, of, of Jesus being fully magnified. What an amazing sight that must have been. And amazing that, you know, these four men got to see it. I, you know, they probably talked a little bit about it with the other disciples, or maybe they didn't. I don't know. That's, that's speculatory. But it, it is an amazing thing that they got to see Moses and Elijah hear God's voice and see Jesus transformed before them. And so we pick up, again, as we're reading in verse 9 through 13, so they come down, he says, tell no one about this until after I'm risen from the dead. Now, I don't know why Jesus said that explicitly, other than perhaps it was not the time, as we've seen elsewhere in the gospel. G Jesus is working on God's divine timetable. And so perhaps it was not meant, I'm, uh, the, base, the base explanation is probably it wasn't not, it wasn't yet time wasn't time for them, for the rest of the people to know about the transfiguration. Jesus set the appropriate time, not until after the resurrection. And so, they faithfully execute what God said there. Now, they do have a question about what happened. Well, they just saw Elijah and Moses, and they asked them, why is it the scribes say Elijah's going to come first? Elijah was the prophesied trailblazer to, to make straight the path of the Lord. Isaiah spoke about that. Uh, and so they asked, well, why is it that Elijah is come first? You know, they just saw Elijah, and, you know, you would recognize him if he had been here already. So you can think, like, well, we haven't seen him in the last three years, so why does it say that he was supposed to come before you? And Jesus says, but I say to you that Elijah did come, and they did with him whatever they wanted. Now, other Gospels are more explicit, but in Matthews, we're even told the disciples understood he's speaking of John the Baptist. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah to uh, set right the paths of the Lord. He was the herald for the coming king, as we saw in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. And in fact, at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, we read about the, the prophecy in chapter, in chapter 1, verse 2, from Isaiah the prophet, um, which uh, Mark spliced together Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1 and Isaiah 40 and verse 3. And the reason why I say Isaiah the prophet is because it was Jewish custom that um, the, the, the longer prophet, that is the one who wrote more, was quoted first um, or cited first, even if it was multiple prophets. Uh, so he says there in verse 2, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's the one of the prophecies they would have been thinking of when they said, well, Elijah is supposed to come first. John came in the spirit of Elijah to make ready the way of the Lord. Uh, it said that all the region of Judea and, and Jerusalem were coming out to be baptized by John, who was pe preaching a baptism of repentance unto the remission of sins. That's what he was preaching. And he was preparing the people much as Elijah did to get the people back to God, John prepared the people to receive Jesus when he showed up. He prepared their hearts. 
Um, he even told a group of Sadducees and Pharisees to, who came out to be baptized, bear fruit and keep a repentance. That is, start living a life that matches what you did here today. And these would have been tender hearts, no matter who was coming out to him if they received that baptism. Tender hearts that were eagerly anticipating the, the coming of Jesus. Now, not all of them followed, unfortunately, but many of them, when Jesus showed up, they began following him. So much so in John chapter 3 and verse 30 that when some of John the Baptist's disciples asked him, basically, aren't you upset that they're all following Jesus now? John the Baptist said in John chapter 3 and verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. And so with that, we have the transfiguration and that question answered. We're going to move on our text back in Matthew chapter 17, uh, starting verse 14. I will read through verse 23. <laughs> When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him. And the demon came out of the boy, and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive him out? And he said to them, Because of your littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will be moved, and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And while they were gathering together, gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to him, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and they will raise him up on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. So we have this man who comes to Jesus as they're going into this region. And he, he's crying out, Have mercy upon my son, because your disciples, now we're not told what disciples, it could be one larger group, but I'm of the opinion that's the other of the twelve, not Peter, James, or John, but the others. Um, the nine there, uh, who attempted to cast out this demon, says they, they weren't able to cure him. And so Jesus, let's have a statement, how long will I be with this unbelieving and pervert, perverted generation? It seems again that maybe irritation is not the right word for deity, um, but I'm going to last for words uh, for what to use, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to use that. It seems like God, Jesus is a little perhaps irritated or grieved, I think maybe grieved is the better word um, there, that his disciples still aren't getting everything. Um, but he's, he, he sighs. He says, how long shall I put up with you? How long shall I be with you? Bring him here to me. And the disciples asked him, well, why couldn't we cast it out? And it really came back down to faith. A deep abiding trust in God and his word. He says, because of your littleness of your faith, you could not drive him out. For I say to you, if you, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, which is a really tiny seed, he said, you should be able to say to these mountains, the hills of Galilee, to get up and move, and they'll move. Um, and nothing will be impossible for you. So there's a lesson here for us, too. And oftentimes, perhaps, when our prayers aren't answered, or we, we don't think God's actually active in the world today, or we're, we become impatient, Perhaps it's because we have prayed and we didn't believe. We're, li we're living vocally that we believe in God, but our actual, our mind, our heart doesn't, it ha isn't there yet. We're not placing the trust as we ought to. Uh, Jesus said that it's because of the littleness of the faith that they couldn't drive out this demon. How, how many prayers have gone unanswered because of our littleness of faith? I mean, that's what James said in James chapter 1, that if anyone asks with any doubt... That man ought not to receive, expect to receive anything because he's like the, he's like the surf of the sea tossed to and fro. He's unstable. You know, granted, it takes time to build that faith, but you know, maybe it's a question we need to ask ourselves next time we, we think our prayers aren't being answered. Well, what am I holding back from God? What is holding me back from God? Is there anything? And if you can answer no, there is, and I'm fully committed, then maybe the answer is no there on that prayer. But I think there's a lesson here about faith and prayer here as well. And towards the end of this chunk, we, we see again Jesus start again teaching that he's going to be handed over to the evil, sinful men. 
He's going to be killed and he's going to be raised up on the third day. And the disciples still aren't getting it. Just like Peter didn't, they didn't get it in chapter 16. Um, they were deeply grieved, it says in verse 23. They're, they're, they're thinking of themselves. They're thinking of the fact that they're going to lose Jesus. They're not quite understanding what he's come to do. But in due time, that would be made clear. Now, as we bring this video to a close, we're going to read this last chunk here, and we're going to make just a, one or two points on this section for us. It's, it's a pretty straightforward section here. So starting in verse 24, when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? And they said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? And Jesus said, From strangers. Jesus said to him, Then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offer offend them, Go to the sea and throw in a hook, and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take it and give it to them for you and for me. So they come into Capernaum, and they're, they're met with these tax collectors. Um, from my understanding and research, this is the temple tax. So this isn't uh, Roman taxes, but this is the taxes levied on the Jews to maintain the temple. And so it was about two drachma, which was about two days' wages. It roughly uh, exchanged for a denarii, uh, which was the Roman currency. And so it's two days' wages, and they're asking, does, not, does your teacher not pay the poll tax? And so he goes to, him to, talk, goes to Jesus to talk about this, and before Peter can even say anything, Jesus says, it's a simple question. Like, so who, you know, who do kings collect taxes from? Their citizens or their family? Well, Peter says, the citizens. So this is so the sons are exempt. Now what Jesus is saying here, you think about it. If it's the temple tax, who is Jesus? He's the son of God. The Hebrew writer says he is the exact representation of deity. He's God in the flesh. And the temple is the temple to God. And so if he is the son of God, and the temple is built to his glory, why does he need to pay the poll tax? When it's his house. It's his temple. And so that's why Jesus says, so the sons are exempt. It's interesting, some have seen this as, again, in our subtle claim to deity. That Jesus said, I'm, I'm God. Because I don't need to pay the temple tax. Because it's my temple. Um, but he says, so we don't give offense to them. You know, and then he works a miracle. Go catch the fish. The first one you find, you'll find uh, a shekel which apparently was enough to carry, uh, cover the two drachma tax. <laughs> so he works this miracle again to manifest his glory and his uh, deity so that they would understand that he is God. So he does it so far. He, he claims to be God here twice, really. So the working of the miracle to show his power, that he is approved by God and the things he's saying is true, and through the statement that the sons are exempt. He's identifying himself as a son, as the son, as God himself. So we hope this video, as we bring it to a close, was helpful and encouraging to you, that we got something out of uh, Matthew chapter 17 here. Our next video will be going over Matthew 18. As we continue in our study, we're, gonna, we're nearing the end, really, of the gospel. We're getting the last chunk of it. Uh, we're going to see over the next several chapters. Um, Jesus is going to be sp teaching more and more at length. Uh, chapter 18 deals with uh, principles of stumbling blocks and forgiveness and prayer. Matthew 19 deals with a very serious issue and sometimes uncomfortable, but it's in the Word of God, so we're going to teach it about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and, and, and we read about an incident with the rich young ruler. Once we get out of the teens and into the 20s, we're going to see the, the final teachings of Jesus, the triumphal entry, and the prophecies about the destruction of Jerusalem and eventually his death, burial, and resurrection. So we hope these videos have been informative for you, that you've been edified and built up by these. And if you're in the greater Tucson area, I want to personally invite you to attend with us in person. Uh, we're meeting right now Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. and that's for our worship hour. And right now uh, we're posting our midweek service online through these videos. Um, and we have a Sunday evening uh, series uh, through the New Testament we've been doing, and that's posted here Sunday evenings as well. If you're not in the Tucson area, 
or you want to see how we do things before you come and visit in person, we live stream our services uh, here on our YouTube channel about 9.50 a.m. Sunday morning, right? It's about 10 minutes before the services start. And uh, all of our content comes here on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell that way you, uh, you're told every time we post new content. And as always, we, we encourage you to reach out for us if you have any questions. We thank you for watching this video. And as always, have a great week. And God bless.